All right. So, um, Dave Williams has been birding for more than 40 years. As a youngster, he was exposed to the out of doors by his parents through camping, hiking, fishing, and travel. He became a serious bird watcher during the blizzard of 78. Dave taught middle school uh, science in Reading for 37 years, and he's a graduate of Audubon's Birder Certificate Program, which is a year long study of birds. He also attended Maine Audubon's Hog Island Field Ornithology Program. Presently, Dave is a volunteer teacher naturalist at Mass Audubon's Joppa Flats Sanctuary in Newburyport, where he works with school groups and leads bird walks. Dave is also active with the Ipswich River Watershed Association. He loves to share his passion and enthusiasm for birds uh, with folks, and he leads bird walks in his hometown for the Brookline Bird Club, the trustees, and other organizations. Uh, Dave is a past president of the Brookline Bird, Bird Club. So thank you, Dave, as always, for generously offering your time and expertise to us. Um, and before we begin, I'd just like to say a few words in honor of the original stewards of the unceded land where Reading Public Library is located, the Pawtucket Band of the Massachusetts Tribe. Massachusetts tribe are the descendants of the original people that the English first encountered in what is now the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Um, Pawtucket is also the name of the land. Um, it's now called Lynn. It's a vast territory that extends from the Piscataqua River in New Hampshire down to the Charles River. And we just want to acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land, the waterways, living beings, including birds, um, and the Pawtucket, the people who have stewarded this land for many millennia. And we encourage everyone to learn more. Um, and I will put a link for more information about the Massachusetts tribe in the chat. And I'll send it along with the, the resource later. Um, and lastly, I just want to let you all know about some upcoming bird related programming. Starting next month on May 23rd, um, we're trying out having a bird meetup group uh, that will meet every other month. There'll be uh, more informal gatherings where bird loving folk can get together and learn from each other and share their knowledge. And Dave will be there. So it should be a good time. And we're bringing bird walks back this summer. Uh, there will be uh, an enthusiast 7 a.m. walk and a casual 9 a.m. walk in both June and August. Um, I'll send that information uh, along with that resource list that I mentioned that Dave generously put together. Um, and as always, if you want to keep up with the latest and greatest, uh, you can do that by subscribing to our newsletter. All right, without further ado, please welcome Dave Williams. Well, thank you very much, Melissa, and thank all of you for coming out to the last All About Birds session for 2022. I appreciate your attendance, your enthusiasm, and your questions. Um, I want to begin by thanking four photographers who have kindly let me use some of their great uh, shots. Uh, Stan Deutsch, Bob Minton, Mike Densmore, and um, Bob Siciliano. These are Wonderful, wonderful photographers, great guys, and wonderful birders. So thank you. I want to thank my wife, Mary, for her help in um, organizing and helping me to get a clearer view on how to present things. And especially to Melissa for all of your hard work. Um, so here we go. Tonight's presentation is on breeding birds. Um, It is not specific to the town of Reading, nor to the state. I may have inadvertently sent some uh, incorrect information in some of the publications that were used for this show, but presently, Massachusetts has confirmed 191 birds breeding here in the state. And that's based on the Mass Breeding Bird Atlas. And I'll talk to you a little bit more about that. And here in Reading, per my records, I have confirmed that there are approximately 62 species of birds presently breeding here. Here is an outline that I'm going to follow for tonight. Now I wanna begin by saying that breeding bird biology is a massive topic. We could talk for hours, we could get knee deep into science, 
but this is gonna be more of an overview. And um, as a result, I bet some of you are gonna leave here with more questions than you started with. Well, if that's the case, here are four excellent resources for you. And these should answer all of your questions. These resources are in the handout that I put together that Melissa will be um, sending out to you. All right, so breeding birds, let's begin. You're a wood thrush and you're living down in Central America. You're gonna begin the journey north. And this is a wonderful animation of their year long journey to their breeding grounds and then their trip back. So you're a wood thrush and you end up in Reading. And you start your beautiful flute-like song. Well, migration begins, or I am gonna begin this reading bird show with migration. Now, phonology describes the seasonal timing of events in the life of a bird. Spring migration phonology is shifting towards earlier dates as a response to climate change in many bird species. Why is the timing of migration so important for birds? Well, as temperatures warm and precipitation patterns change, many species of plants, insects, and birds have advanced important phenological events. Plants are putting out leaves earlier, insects are emerging sooner, and many birds have advanced the timing of their migration. These changes have been observed for many decades and across different habitat types, although impacts vary between species. Now, last week, my wife and I visited the Concord Museum to see the Alive Wood Birds uh, exhibit of William Brewster. Now, I found this show board very interesting. The top half uh, data taken from Thoreau's journal. So you can see that the Baltimore Oriole would return around May 6th. We'll drop down to the 2010s. The Baltimore Oriole on average is now returning four days earlier, May 2nd. Take a look at the leaf out. All right, May 10th in the 1850s, now it's April 22nd. And then the, the flowering, May 15th back in the 50s and May 3rd. So ecologists are very concerned about the timing and things getting knocked out of whack. Um, maybe that when birds come back, the insect lives that their ancestors knew about are already moved on. So this is something to give some thought to. Uh, we heard that wood thrush, and I'll quickly review why do birds sing? Well, birds have songs and they have calls and each serves a purpose. Male birds sing to mock territories and then they also sing to attract a mate for nesting purposes. There are female birds that sing and a lot of that has to do with communication with their young, with a prospective mate. Birds also have calls. These calls basically fall into two groups. There are warning calls, you know, to try to let others of their type know of predators. And then there are communication calls. These can be calls used during flight migration, it can help others find re, re, uh, food resources, and they can help coordinate behavior. So again, birds have songs and calls. Let's take a look at the chickadee. This is its call, that chickadee dee dee dee. Again, here's the call. That's its song. 
Let's listen again to the song. Hey, sweetie. So again, there's the song and the call of the chickadee. Now let's take our backyard downy woodpecker. Now they have calls. Maybe some of you've heard that um, sharp pick, pick, pick noise, but their song is going to be more of its drumming. They are not doing that to get food. They're doing that to communicate. Now, birds do not form emotional relationships like humans do. And their principal drive for forming a pair bond is to produce offspring rather than for any emotional fulfillment. For all birds, the odds of producing surviving offspring are best with a strong, healthy mate, which is why birds have different courtship rituals to find the most suitable partner. So let's take a look at one of the most spectacular displays by a bird here in the Northeast. This is the American woodcock. It does breed here in Reading in small numbers. I think Bear Meadow would be the best place to go to see and hear these. And the birds do their amazing display at dusk and at dawn. So for about 45 minutes at dusk, and then for about 45 minutes at dusk, they will repeatedly do this flight display. And it's going to begin with a buzzy nasal paint and then continue on to a spectacular display, aerial display. So here it is. That sequence will be, will be repeated numerous times during a 30 to 45 minute time period at dusk and dawn. Have any of you heard that this spring? For me, it's not spring until I have heard this. So again, this is the American woodcock. Now, I'm sure many of you have seen some of the many spectacular nature shows, National Geographic shows that show some amazing and elaborate courtship displays. Um, but this one here is situated right in good old Reading. Now, the courtship between a pair of birds may include several stages, from initially claiming territory to actually wooing a prospective mate with visual and auditory displays, such as stunning plumage, spectacular flights, intricate songs, or even elaborate dances. Well, these are common golden eyes, a common duck we can see here in the winter. The males are on the right and they're doing this elaborate head bobbing. And they, the courtship time for ducks is in the winter. They'll actually get a mate and then migrate north to the breeding grounds where mating will take place. But the courtship takes place down here. The courtship period is when a male bird shows off his health and strength to convince a female that he is her best possible mate and will help her create the strongest, healthiest chicks with the best chance to survive. Here are a pair of hooded, male hooded McGansas. They're going to flash that great big white crest. They're going to kind of rear back onto their backside and they're going to throw that head 
all the way back. Now, different bird species remain in bonded pairs for different lengths of time, and it varies widely. Some bonds, such as the soon to arrive here in Reading, ruby-throated hummingbird, last only long enough for copulation, and then the male bird leaves and has no further role in building a nest, incubating eggs, or raising hatchlings. Other birds, however, remain together throughout the nesting season. Both partners will work together to raise their brood, either by sharing care duties or by one partner supporting the other by bringing food to the nest and deter deterring possible predators. Birds that do stay together for several successive nesting seasons are often said to mate for life, even though those long-term pair bonds may not, in fact, last the length of birds' lives. Depending on the species, birds may remain together until one partner dies, after which the other bird will seek out a new mate. Some birds may stay together for several seasons, but they could find a new, stronger partner at any time and may divorce if they feel it would increase the chances of producing surviving offspring. Now, there are, if we were taking an ecology course tonight, we'd spend a whole evening or two talking about the different breeding systems. But tonight we're gonna to look at monogamy, which an estimated 90% of all bird species use. And that's where one male mates with one female. Now, it doesn't mean that they're not gonna mourn the death of, death of a mate, but they won't miss him or her as they'll quickly find a new mate. And that's particularly true with swans, geese, eagles, red-tailed hawks. And the other breeding system we'll take a look at tonight is polygamy, where one male mates with more than one female, while each female mates with only one male. So let's take a look at some examples of polygamy. Well, our local red-winged blackbird practices this breeding strategy. The males return first to the wetlands here in Reading and set up territories by singing, having displays where they flash their wings and show off those bright orange epaulets. A couple of weeks later, the female returns and she will begin nest building and the males will mate with multiple birds. Another bird that practice polygamy, though they do not nest here in Reading, do nest in several areas in eastern Massachusetts, the purple martins. Um, that's one purple martin. These guys will nest in big colonial colonies. So you could have 30 or 40. So magnify this by 30 or 40. It's quite a racket. And this is what a purple martin looks like. And again, these birds <clears throat> practice polygamy. Now, <clears throat> let's now talk a little bit about nest, eggs, and incubation. And here's where I'm sure you'd have a lot of questions and where a real good reference for you to refer to is what you see on screen right now called Nest Watch. Nests provide a safe place for eggs and the young to develop. Bird nests are extremely diverse, although each species typically has a characteristic nest style. Some birds do not make nests at all and instead lay their eggs in a simple scrape in the ground. And I'll show you a great example of that in a bit. Other birds construct nests from natural materials such as grass, leaves, mud, lichen, and fur, or from human-made materials like paper, plastic, and yarn. How many of you have seen a nest out in your yard that might have a piece of plastic or straw or dog hair? Um, I found a robin's nest when I was a kid 
with part of a basketball net woven into it. Nests can be found almost anywhere, on the ground, in trees, in burrows, on sides of cliffs, in and on human-made structures, etc. Females typically build nests, but sometimes both parrots or just the male will build it. Now, <clears throat> there are two types of hatching strategies asynchronous and synchronous. Synchronous hatching is when all the eggs hatch at roughly the same time or within minutes or hours of one another. Many birds don't start incubating their eggs until the last one is laid, which ensures that the eggs all hatch at about the same time. Asynchronous hatching is when the eggs of a clutch hatch over a period of a few days. The eggs may have been laid one a day for several days. Herons, cranes, cormorants, and raptors begin incubation as soon as the first egg is laid, and therefore their eggs may hatch on different days. The first bird hatched has an advantage over the later hatched birds. Now, what, we're going, what I'm gonna to try to do now is to share my screen and I am going to apologize for this. Are you seeing this? No, Okay. Try going back into share screen. And I have lost that right now. All right, so let's go. Oh, I was afraid this might happen. <laughs> Try, are you in um, a full screen mode? No. Hmm. So is there the menu at the bottom of your Zoom window? That's- I, I've lost that, unfortunately. Hmm. Try going up to the top right hand corner um, that has usually it has the where you'd X out um, but don't X out uh, try clicking the square that's next to the X I think- uh, There you go. I'll, all right. I apologize for my clumsiness, but this is one of the sources, resources I suggest you take a look at. It is called Nest Watch and it's from Cornell. And you can spend a lot of time exploring, but let's take a look at a couple of things I think you might do. So you'd wanna click on learn and then click on common nesting birds. And then you can scroll through or you can set up uh, some parameters. We'll set up east. Um, and let's take a look. We'll start with a robin. You click on that. And look at all you can find out about this bird. You have nests in images. You've got plumage images of the bird. There's songs and calls. But what I like is it down here, when to look. We've got a, a graphic that'll show you the basic timeline for you to look for robins, where to find it, the habitat. What you'll find, the nest type is described, the chicks are altricial, clutch size, approximate nest type, incubation period. That's how long it takes for the eggs to hatch. And the brooding period is how long it takes for those little ones to then fly. And then some useful hints. So this is a wonderful site and I'd strongly urge you to go here and um, you know, explore it. Now, let's see if I can't get back to, how is this, Melissa, can you see this?
I was muted. I was saying yes, perfect. <laughs> Can you see this now? Yep. <laughs> All right, great. Now, let's talk about the two basic developmental methods of young. One is called altricial and the other is precocial. Altricial is when the young are born naked, immobile, they don't have feathers, their eyes are closed, and they are completely dependent on their parents for survival. Altricial birds include herons, hawks, woodpeckers, owls, and most songbirds. Now, precocial are young that can typically move about, have their eyes open, and will be covered in down at hatching. In a matter of a couple of hours, they can walk about, leave the nest, and feed themselves. But let's take a look at some examples here. So we're going to start with um, some altricial types of birds. Here's the American robin. They're born naked. I'm sure all of you have seen robins, blue jays, cardinals, house finches in your backyard. They are completely and totally dependent on their parents. And they are gonna grow very, very quickly. This is an American red stat sitting on its nest. They'll be passing through Redding in another week. Though they don't nest here, they'll nest in other spots in eastern Massachusetts. Your backyard blue jay. And then Baltimore Orioles. They should be returning next week. Most neighborhoods are going to have a pair of Baltimore Orioles. They have that nice big cup-like nest, that hanging sack from trees, oaks and maples. And again, look at these begging young. Great picture by Stan. You can see the parent is coming in to feed them. So these altricial birds are completely dependent on their parents. These Many of you are familiar with the little ducklings. Now, here's another great example. These are peregrine falcons. They're, um, they have nested over in Wuben for the last decade. And uh, Bob got some wonderful photographs of the adult feeding the young. These young are totally dependent on their parents. So the, Parent brought in its prey. It's going to rip and tear pieces off and feed these youngsters. And look at that shot. Right out of National Geographic. At the same location in Wuben is a common raven nesting. And look at its two big chicks. Big as they are, they're still dependent on mom and dad to bring them food and feed them and protect them. Now, let's take a look at some examples of precocial birds. And to do that, I'm going to show you a series of slides about the piping plover that I took up on Crane Beach. The piping plover returned to northeastern Massachusetts the end of March and throughout April. My wife and I were walking on Crane Beach last Sunday and watched four or five of these chase one another around, call, and begin to set up their territories. After copulation, the female will make its nest, and the nest is nothing more than a scrape in the sand above the high tide line so it won't get washed out, hopefully. It just puts its butt in the sand and wiggles it back and forth. And then they take turns in incubating the eggs. This is a nest enclosure deliberately put over this nest by the biologists as a method to protect them from four legged predators in big birds. The piping plover can get in and out of that gauge wire 
but other predators can't get in. This is what their eggs look like. They're quite camouflaged. And here are the chicks. Now, I'm gonna stop just for a minute. I mentioned that the male and female piping plovers take turns incubating the eggs. I've had the great fortune to sit for an hour or two and just watch a pair. Let's say you have the female sitting on the eggs. The male is out feeding. Well, then the male will approach the nest and start that single note piping call. The female will get up off the nest and run away. And as she does that, the male will run and get on the nest. Now the female will feed for 45 minutes and these birds will repeat this process day and night until those eggs have hatched. And when they've hatched, this is about a two day old piping plover chick, maybe a day. They look like cotton balls on sticks and they have the ability to feed themselves. Look at this picture Stan took. Look at that big sand flea of some type. All the parent is going to do is to protect them and lead them to rich feeding areas. She protects them by kind of sitting on them, spreading her wings out in umbrella-like fashion. And what is she protecting them from? Well, intense heat, rain, windstorms, possible, you know, predators. Look at this. The little fellow will just run and hide under mom or dad. There's a little guy high stepping down the beach. And this is one of our favorite shots. This little guy hiding behind a piece of trash on the beach, just looking over, saying, hey, what's going on here? How many piping plover chicks do you see? When these birds don't move, they just disappear. That coloration is great for camouflage. If you said three, you are right. And these are the piping plovers that have fledged. All four of those birds were born about 40 days ago. They can now fly and come mid-August, they will begin their migration south. Just amazing. Here's another precocial bird that has on occasion nested here in Reading. This is the killdeer. Now, the killdeer have nested up on the old Reading Memorial High School field house roof when it was gravel. One year, a pair nested behind the starting line on the track in the gravel. One year when I was coaching Little League, a pair nested in the mulch around a tree at Memorial Park. And for those of you who went to Coolidge or may have kids who went to Coolidge Middle School, you know that they've nested in the courtyard there on a couple of occasions. And anyone pick up on the Jeopardy question the other night? Had to do with Coolidge. Uh, mallard ducks have nested in that courtyard off and on for many, many, many years. Again, the mother and father will take care of these birds leading to feeding grounds. Look at all those legs. How many birds? Well, count up the legs and divide by two. Again, this bird deliberately went out onto this straw-like matter because she'll blend in better. And again, a brown cotton ball on sticks. Kildeas. Plovers, like the piping plover, have a unique distraction display to deter predators. They'll spread their wing out like it's broken, fan their tail, and start screaming and drag that wing. And they're deliberately trying to lead a predator away from its nest. When they feel it's gotten far enough away, it will just fly off and say, uh huh, fooled you. So if you ever come across this, a bell should go off in your head saying, hey, I'm too close to a nest. Well, by the way, the killdeer have also nested down uh, by the DPW station. 
here in Reading. Turn, feeding one another. These are least terns. They breed at Sandy Point. Sandy Point is the state park that Massachusetts owns at the end of the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge. How many babies do you see there? Two, one in front and one just behind this least turn. Look at this, great shot by Bob. Is the adult feeding the young? These little guys are probably three, four days old. There's a bigger one, this is probably 10 days old. He just walks around and they, um... all right, so let's take a look at something called imprinting. This is a form of learning in which an animal gains its sense of species identification. Birds do not automatically know what they are when they hatch. They visually imprint on their parents during a critical period of development. After imprinting, they will identify with that species for life. Maybe some of you again have seen some neat National Geographic or nature shows where scientists have tried to reestablish new populations of whooping crane or sandhill crane by having them imprint on a ultralight aircraft and then flying it and the birds think it's its parents and will follow it. Another type of imprinting is known as sight fidelity. These bald eagles that you see here, not only are gonna imprint on their parents and know that they're a bald eagle, they're gonna imprint on that territory. So when it comes time for them to breed, they're gonna to return to this general area. Now, in the case of an eagle, it could be, you know, a four, five, six, 10 mile, you know, radius. This bald eagle uh, nest I found on Suntog Lake in Linfield in 2015, and ever since then, the birds have been nesting there. The male bird is off to the left, the female's on the nest. That male bird is about 10 to 15% smaller than the female. And here's a shot Bob took up in Maine. That's a great big baby. He's standing on the edge of that nest, yelling and flapping his wings. He's getting ready for his first flight. And I've seen this happen over in Linfield. They flap their wings, they're stretching their muscles and they're getting ready for that first flight. This is a juvenile chick, weighs nine and a half pounds. Um, because I reported this nest to Mass Wildlife as a thank you, they invited me in when they banded it. And it was a phenomenal experience for me, um, not only seeing these young, but the immense care and professionalism of biologists and um, volunteers showed to this bird. Um, this bird is of an age now, it's what, seven years old, that it could be returning. I keep checking records now and then to see if this particular band number has been reported, but to my knowledge, it hasn't. Um, many of you are familiar with the newt swans over in Wuben. They're on their nest even when it snows out. I saw a pair of mute swans this morning in the town forest, but both were swimming around. So that would lead me to believe that uh, they haven't nested yet or they were unsuccessful. Mute swans are excellent parents. There are some signets being protected by one parent while the other is chasing off the Canada geese that are intruding. Canada geese are wonderful parents. Now, while we might curse them because they poop up the town commons and golf courses, they are wonderful parents. And I wanted to also show you another neat bird, the sandhill crane. Now, there's probably no more than two or three dozen nesting in all of New England. 
Last year, there were four pair in Massachusetts, but down south, they're all over the place. And um, when I was in Florida a year or so ago, we took these pictures of these sand hill cranes. Now, they do these big displays that call, that's just one bird. Imagine if you came across a roost of five or 10,000 of these, like you might out in Nebraska in March. What's a baby sandhill crane called? Look at this picture. Um, I was alerted to a nest location. There's a fence between me and this bird and I'm using a telephoto lens. So I did not stress this bird out at all. And there's the little one. Little sandhill cranes are called colts. They are born asynchronous. This bird is about a day, maybe two days old. And that egg has just cracked open and it will probably hatch the next day. And again, the parents will protect them, lead them to areas to hunt. And this is a method of protecting, walking them across the highway. Another bird in the same swamp down in Florida, the common gallinu. Again, there's probably a half a dozen pair of these nesting in Massachusetts, but down in the south and southeast, they're quite numerous. Now, anytime you're talking about breeding birds and young, I think you need to talk a little bit about the ethics and conservation. Um, and I've taken these three points from the American Birding Association. And the big takeaway is try to avoid stressing these birds or exposing them to danger. So that could mean many things if you've got a bird breeding in your yard, keeping your kids away from it, keeping your cat indoors, keeping your dog on a leash or away from that area, maybe turning the lights off in that area. Um, so you always want to use caution and restraint when entering a breeding bird area. That especially goes for bird watchers, photographers, and overall nature lovers. We need to give these birds space. Um, if you find a hawk or an owl nesting nearby, I would be judicious in who you tell about it. And again, do what you can to keep the area secure. The other thing you can do is to support the conservation of birds and their habitat. Engage in and promote bird friendly practices whenever possible. You know, try to reduce window strikes, maintain safe and clean feeding stations, and attempt to landscape with native plants when possible. Now, as I begin to slowly bring this presentation to an end, I wanna show you a selection of shots that I think will highlight some of the things we've talked about, as well as being neat photographs. This is a great egret. Great egrets, like great blue herons, nest in rookeries. They're colonial nesters. There could be a lot of them. This is from the Venice heron rookery in Venice, Florida. And there, not only are there great egrets, there's a double-crested cormorant, there's a black-crowned night heron, and there's great blue heron here. Look at those plumes. Those plumes were what drove this bird to near extinction at the turn of the century. Those plumes were sought out by hunters for the haberdashery market for women's hats. Look at those two fluffy chicks there. And look at those magnificent plumes, but look at the eye. During breeding season, that part of the eye, known as the laws, gets a bright lime green. Here's a great blue heron in that same colony. But now let's shift up here. This is up in uh, Byfield, Massachusetts, a beaver swamp. 
And this was a really big rookery of about 40 nests. Look at the tree on the left and come halfway down and look at that nest. That's no great blue heron. That's a great horned owl. Great horned owls don't make their own nests. They usurp somebody else's and adapt it to their own use. And these birds live here in peace. This is from a new rookery over in the Audubon Marsh, out behind the marketplace there, you know, where Whole Foods is. There's probably three or four nests. And my thought is that these are birds that used to nest on Suntog Reservoir. If you want to see a really big great blue heron rookery, pull into Spinelli's parking lot on Route 1 southbound there in Peabody. Get out and look at the island out there. Bring your binoculars. Last week I counted 31 active nests with 52 birds about. It was really something. Again, here's a picture of that great horned owl hanging out there. Oh, I'm gonna go back here. Whoop, whoop. I'm not sure how I can go back up here. Last Sunday, I was in the Reading Town Forest and I saw a great blue heron land in a tree and break off a stick and fly down river. So from the town forest, it was heading towards Mill Street. This would indicate to me that it's got a nest that it's building or rehabbing nearby. So if you're ever up in that area, check things out. There might be a, a new rookery in the process of development. Here is the osprey, very, very popular here in New England. You spend time in the Cape, or in Maine. These birds have made an absolutely remarkable comeback from uh, near decimation in the 60s and 70s due to uh, the use of DDT. And now they're all over the place. Um, here's an osprey carrying a stick that's gonna add to its nest. There he is sitting on its nest. Um, these guys will build their nests in trees, on navigational markers, on the chimneys, roofs of houses, um, boats that have been abandoned or not used, um, sometimes right on the ground in a marsh above the high tide line. Um, and if you get close to the nest, they're gonna let you know it. Last week, I let a bird walk on the Parker River National Wildlife Refuge and a great big immature bald eagle came flying down and two osprey dove, dive bombed it, chasing it out of its nesting territory. And the eagle uh, took off and landed on the ground. And um, it was really spectacular to watch in flight, the bald eagle rolled on its back and put its talons straight up in the air as if to say, come on, osprey, give, me a, give it your best. But uh, these birds are fierce defenders of their territory. And again, look at this picture. Caught a fish, ripping off a piece, and is going to feed it to that little guy. Oh, there are some tree swallows. Again, I counted 37 of up, up in the town forest this morning while I was birding there. And they are cavity nesters. They were all over the dead trees along the river and the marsh, exploring these holes. Because the cavity nesters, we've learned that they'll readily take to nest boxes. Here's another swallow, uh, the barn swallow. These birds, I've had a you know, number of people tell me over the years, they saw them they used to nest in the bathhouses up at uh, Meadowbrook Country Club um, down by the pool. I don't think that happens anymore you know, for cleanliness sakes. You're not gonna want the birds in there, but. Uh, they nest under the eaves of things. Uh, this is under the roof of the maintenance quarters. And look at that. These birds are totally dependent, getting fed. And look at those four little fatties on the right. They're gonna 
probably get ready to fly in another day or two. Here's a barred owl pair. Um, these are young ones that are probably uh, within a week of fledging. I'll go back to my you know, conservation. If you find a pair of barred owls or great horned owls or even screech owls in your yard and neighborhood, you know, watch them, enjoy them, but don't get too close. Don't invite everybody and their grandmother to come in and stress them out. The red-bellied woodpecker. These, I saw my first red belly in Reading in 1994, did an amazing job in expanding. Almost every neighborhood in Reading will now have a pair of wet red bellies. Now, imagine that if they're in your gutter. I had one of these guys go off in my gutter the other day. Um, and it makes a hellacious racket. And here, the pileated woodpecker. Now, I don't have any solid evidence that they have nested in Redding. However, I bet a dollar that they have. I heard one this morning. Um, last week, I heard one. Um, again, along that whole Ipswich River corridor, that'd be a good place to look and listen. And look at this, the adults come in and kind of feed those youngsters. Now, how many of you have had a house finch nest on your front porch in a wreath, in a potted plant, in a flower pot or whatnot? Um, I get calls every year about this. So you just have to be careful, try to maybe relocate them right off the bat, uh, or just put up with their noise and mess for a couple of weeks that they'll be there. Again, here is a review of the nesting cycle. Finding a place to breed, choosing a mate, nest building, copulation and egg formation, egg laying, incubation, hatching, feeding the young, and fledging. Now, before I end, I want to share my screen again. I hope I'm a little bit more successful and talk to you about a very special project that was done in Massachusetts uh, between 2007 and 2011. It was their second breeding bird atlas. More than 650 volunteer citizen scientists worked more than 43,000 hours and surveyed more than a thousand blocks, geographic blocks within the state. So let me see if I can do this. Melissa, can you see this? No, try hitting the share screen again. How's that? Yep, Breeding Bird Atlas. Okay, now the Breeding Bird Atlas, um, you could purchase as a book or a PDF or just go online, search for this Breeding Bird Atlas too, and you can search the results and um, well, I guess I'm not, uh, Well, I am having problems sharing this, I think. Let me try it again. Yeah, look for the, in the share, in the box in the top left, the option that just says screen. I didn't get that. Could you try again? <laughs> now my watch is telling me. 
<laughs> I am going to try. <laughs> so, how is that? Can you see this now? Yes. All right. So, you want to go to their Breeding Bird Atlas site. Click on Breeding Bird Atlas 2. And as I said, you could purchase this as a book or a PDF, but I would just go over here to results. And there is a huge amount of data for you to refer to. Remember, this is a scientific program. What I think you will find most interesting is the find a bird section. So you click on that, find a bird. And then in the search box, you can type in the bird you're interested in. Um, <clears throat> let's take the wood duck. These birds do nest in Reading. So let's click on it. You'll get some nice artwork, the historical status. But then what I like is a comparison between the first atlas done in the 1970s and the second atlas done you know, in the mid 2000s. You can see you know, dramatically the results. You scroll down and the state was broken into over 1000 boxes and each box was visited more than 20 hours during the breeding season by volunteers looking to collect data. And you can see, again, all kinds of information here. So let's pick another, let's type in something. Let's pick uh, the American Robin. And again, some nice artwork, the historic status. And then this data here will help you look at any changes between the 70s and the 2000s. Um, and there are some real dramatic changes, not so much for birds in Reading, but grassland birds, um, Eastern meadowlarks, bobolinks, their numbers have dropped precipitous, you know, precipitously. So I strongly urge you to take a look at this site. So what I'm going to try to do now is to go back to, can you see this again, Melissa? Yes. All right, and let me just zip down because I would like to say thank you. Um, I enjoy doing this. I apologize for my clumsiness in sharing the screen, but um, I hope my points were made. Again, I want to thank Mike, Stan, Bob, and Bob for the use of their photographs. If Again, if you've enjoyed this series of All About Birds, you may want to come to one of these meetups. I'll be there. Um, and can help to facilitate discussions and whatnot. And um, Melissa and I are already in negotiations for some All About Birds next winter, uh, hopefully in person. So again, I wanna thank you all very much. And if you have any questions, um, we can go live and in person and um, you know, I'll do my best to answer them. Yeah, we did get one through the chat. Um... Okay. Someone said that they saw a kill deer at Horn Pond recently. And does that mean that they're maybe nesting there? Well, that you raise a good question. Remember, birds are migrating right now. Just because we see that bird does not mean they're going to breed here. They could be just stopping here and then moving on in their journey. If you go to that breeding bird to Atlas, they talk about the methodology that they use in determining what birds are nesting. And there are particular time periods that are established 
for um, determining if a bird is nesting or if it's just really passing through. So could the kill be, be nesting over there in Han Pond? It could, but chances are it could be moving on. I'm guessing you may have seen it over by the community gardens. That uh, is a place where I know they have bred or have attempted to breed. Um, and how soon can you see woodcocks here? Well, they return in the in March, sometimes as early as February. Um, you should go up to Bear Meadow at dusk. I don't know, whatever sunset is, get there a few minutes before it and hang out and listen. Now, if you're not from Reading, don't come tearing to Bear Meadow. Think about where can you find a decent sized field of two or three acres that abuts woodlands? You know, up at the Ipswich River Wildlife Sanctuary in Topsfield is a great place. Um, some golf courses, the Mary Cummings Park over there in Burlington. I know folks had seven or eight there a few weeks ago. Ipswich River Park in North Reading. I don't even go out to all those fields where the kids are playing. I just work those um, fields near the first two parking lots. And is the falcon at Rag Rock Hill Park uh, at Woburn? Um, this person would like to go see them. Um, I, I can't remember the name of the street. You could email me and I'll find the address. It's out in back of uh, one of those gyms, like, like Planet Fitness or something. It's a great big, huge rock cliff behind there. Um, I mean, everybody knows about it, so I, I don't think I'm giving away anything, but uh, I just can't for the life of me remember the address. So email me and I'll send you the address. Hey. Peregrine, uh, these peregrine falcons have returned dramatically to um, Massachusetts. They were affected greatly by DDT. There's probably seven or eight pair nesting in downtown Boston on big buildings. They nest under the Sagamore Bridge, um, down in the Cape, up on Route 1 in Newburyport. There's a nest in uh, Mass Wildlife as a peregrine cam for that. Um, they ne they're natural nesting uh, cliffs, and they've returned to some of their, their historical sites out in the western part of the state, you know, Mount Tom and the like. Um, and let's see, someone here says uh, Blueberry Hill in Woburn, is that maybe it? Well, what I used to call Blueberry Hill when I was a kid is all developed with condominiums now. So I mean, Blueberry Hill is a, a, you know, a colloquial term. This is uh, over near Green Street. Um, Again, it, it just slips my mind. I, I haven't even gone there this year, um, but email me and I'll get you the address and directions. Okay, and someone saw a warbler in their backyard and could that mean that it's nesting? Probably not. Um, the war warbler migration is really getting underway right now. This morning in the town forest, I had 17 yellow rump warblers, they're all over the place singing. But they're not gonna nest here in Reading. They're gonna continue on north and west. Same, I had four palm warblers, I think. They're gonna continue on north. But I did have three or four pine warblers. They will nest. So if you have a big stand of pines in your yard, and you had a palm pine warbler singing, it could be. Based on my records, the only warblers that nest in Reading are the pine warbler, the yellow warbler, the common yellow throat, and the oven bird. Now, it, is it possible that another one might? It, it, it is, but I, I don't have any definitive proof like I do on those four. But this is a great time over the next four weeks to get out and check 
your trees and your yard for warblers. Make sure your bird baths are full of water. They'll come in and take a bath. Uh, especially check out any oak trees you have. Good tips. Um, someone else would like to know where you can buy a telescope for bird watching. Um, well, obviously you could buy them online, but um, if I was you, I would recommend that you go on a free bird walk with the Brookline Bird Club, the Monotony Bird Club, um, Merrimack Valley Bird Club, or a trip where, you know, Mass Audubon and ask to take a look at the scopes. And um, they run the gamut. You know, you can spend three or $400 or you could drop $4,500. Um, there aren't too many stores around that sell them. Leica has a store in Boston. I would urge you, if you're serious, to go up to the Newburyport Gift and Supply Store at the Route 1 Rotary in Newburyport the owner is Steve Grinley. Tell him I sent you. And uh, he's wonderful. He'll explain things, lay out the various price points, let you take it outside in the parking lot and look through it. Um, you know, and if you want, give me a call or an email and I'll let you take a look through my scope and see what you think. But I wouldn't buy one sight unseen. By the way, Steve's store also sells used scopes on consignment, and you can get some good scopes at a good price. Good to know. Um, someone else asks, uh, you said that, or did you say that hummingbirds are arriving soon? I have heard of two or three reports. A guy I know saw one at Mary Cummings Park in Burlington today. My rule of thumb is May 1st. However, I'm gonna put my hummingbird feed up, feeder up tomorrow or the next day. If I was you, I'd clean them all out, get them ready and hang them up. Um, in a week from today, they should start to be zipping by. First week in May, we should start to get Baltimore Orioles. Last year, I put up a Oriole feeder with a grape jelly and they were all over it. So I'm gonna get mine up next week. All right, that's what we had in the chat for questions. Um, if anyone wants to send more, I'm still watching the chat. 